Today we got a crossover episode between the GIU gentleman and myself, Tom O'Brien from, from Alpha to Omega. We're going to be discussing this paper called Soviet Planning and the Labour Time Calculation Model Implications for 21st Century Socialism, <laughs> if that exists, by a Korean, a Korean fella, So Jing Jong. Who I did try and get on the podcast, but he never responded to me. So I asked. The, <laughs> oh no! You're you're just you're just substitutes, lads. Substitutes. <laughs> so what were your what were your thoughts then, guys, on this paper? Uh, so I think it's. I guess it follows on kind of like Cockshot and Cottrell's argument about labor time usage under socialism. That's you know good enough, but uh, it definitely kind of contrasts some of the methods that were not used in the Soviet Union, even though they were entertained, with what was actually done in the Soviet Union and why that was quite a mess. There's also some stuff in here about sort of the limitations of uh, planning by labor time, which is interesting. Uh, I might get to talk about that. Overall, I think it's a it's a pretty good presentation of the subject. Yeah, I mean, I, I generally agree. Um, I'm not I'm not so much of like a value theory nerd, so I, I'm sure some of it probably went over my head. But um, uh, the thing that that stood out to me was um, just the the huge gap between the like uh, the position that Marx really like advocates for, like, and the kind of um, the kind of a society he advocates for versus the like Soviet Union and what it actually kind of ended up doing and. Uh, and how, you know, for a lot of these folks, it's like, uh, they weren't even trying to do what Marx wanted to do. So it, it, mm-hmm. you know, it doesn't even resemble Marxism, you know? Which is fucking weird. Like, um, it's really weird to see, I don't know, neo bakarinists or whatever also call themselves Marxists or whatever, or try, try to, like, resurrect that kind of stuff and then still be like, oh, yeah, but, like, what, what he was talking about simply did not bear any resemblance to what Marx wanted, so... How can you call it Marxist planning? I don't fucking know. It's weird, but like, it was really interesting to see that foregrounded in this uh, in this essay. Right? Yeah. the The emphasis on the critique of the Gotha program is worth uh, taking a look at here. Mm-hmm, totally. In case anybody doesn't know, Kyle, would you give us a description of what Marxist Marx's planning based on labor time in the Gotha program in the critique of the Gotha program was all about? Uh, all right. So this is drawing on uh, Owenism as like kind of its background, right? So Owen was a utopian socialist, came up with these idea with this idea of labor vouchers for workers to get consumer goods. And Marx kind of built on that in trying to describe the transition to communism. So, I mean, it might just be best to read Marx's own words here. So he says, uh, in the critique of the Gotha program, within a collective society based on the common ownership of the means of production, the producers do not exchange their products. Just as little does the labor employed on the products appear here as the value of these products, as material quality possessed by them, since now, in contrast to capitalist society, Individual labor no longer exists in an indirect fashion, but directly as a component part of the total labor. The phrase proceeds of labor, objectionable even today on account of its ambiguity, thus loses all meaning. What we are dealing with here is a communist society, not as it has developed on its own foundations, but on the contrary, just as it emerges from capitalist society, which is thus in every respect, economically, morally, and intellectually, still stamped with the birthmarks of the old society from whose womb it emerges. Accordingly, the individual producer receives back from society, after the deductions have been made, exactly what he gives to it. What he has given to it is his individual quantum of labor. For example, the social working day consists of the sum of the individual hours of work. The individual labor time of the individual producer is the part of the social working day contributed by him, his share in it. 
he receives a certificate from society that he has furnished such and such an amount of labor after deducting his labor for the common funds. And with this certificate, he draws from the social stock of means of consumption as much as the same amount of labor costs. The same amount of labor which he has given to society in one form, he receives back in another. Uh, so what's being described here is a labor voucher system uh, that is based on uh, labor time calculations, right? So you don't get back exactly the amount of labor time that uh, you put in because there will be a tax that will go towards sort of like common investment in infrastructure and stuff. But you do get back overall the same amount that you put in. And that is accounted in hours worked. So that's an important point to make there is that you're putting in pure hours that you actually worked and it's not how productive you were in an hour that you get work. So, for example, if you're not particularly productive or you are quite productive, you both get the same wage because it's done on labor time and not like productivity of labor, the individual laborer. Right. That's right. There is a discussion in the Critique of the Gotha program about the inequality of labor, but it does unequivocally say you get back exactly what you put in. So, yes, I, I think that's correct. So th the reason why this point for me is very important is because if you don't have... Well, we're going to get to this later on, but if you if you actually do it on a socially necessary labor time, what you end up having is society being conditioned again mm -hmm. it's like allowing the this abstract labor coming back in as in a, a, instead of concrete labor which is one of the things that yeah. conditions society away from it forces society into like a, a feedback of ever being more productive without making that actual d decision to be more productive yes so when a socialist regime or a communist regime tries to maximize the efficiency of labor, they're doing it through a planning process that's going to economize labor as much as possible. It's different from the kinds of economizing that you get in a market system or a, certainly a capitalist system. What you're describing there, Tom, uh, in terms of that kind of like uh, socially necessary labor time is the kinds of contradictions that we started to see under market socialism, right? Correct. Like, you know, your your wage is dependent on the productivity of the workplace you work in, not your equal participation in the, the common labor product. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like if you think about it from this point of view of being paid for like your concrete labor as opposed to like, you know, your socially necessary, your the average like if you if you produce a hundred shoes or whatever, and the average is two hundred an hour, you're only getting half the pay. Like so, like from society from a societal point of view, what you want to do is decrease the amount of labor people have to work. Right? You want everybody to be have more free time or get more stuff for the amount they work. But if you if you do it from like that yeah. kind of conditioning the individual laborer. It forces the, the kind of pressure onto the individual. But if you were to say, for example, a communist society and you say, well, we want to reduce our hours in mining by 10 percent, you know, you say, well, let's design a new machine. Let's get it in there and you increase your productivity that way, as opposed to driving it onto the worker. It's more of a collective decision about what can we do in a community to increase productivity in this place. Yeah. And, and crucially, if you are economizing in terms of labor time, it removes the possibility of extracting absolute surplus value, right? That you, you just sweat labor harder or you make them work longer hours in order to increase profitability. Because if you are accounting in labor units, making your workers work longer in order to get extra value is just impossible, right? you're actually losing out when you make people work more. Indeed. I, th I thought as well that, that like, before they get to the Marx quote, there's some interesting bits where um, they're contrasting Marxist communism versus capitalism, but on the basis of 
how labor is controlled overall and what is controlled for. In in Marxist communism, economic life is operated and determined by human beings autonomously. So the thing that is controlled is the production of life itself. And it is controlled by the producers of life, right? Like that, so that the planners, the, the, uh, the producers are the planners, right? And the thing that is planned for is simply the, the imminent production of the lived experience. Whereas in capitalism or in like market socialism or whatever the fuck it is, the law of value does the controlling. So, and the thing that is controlled for is really kind of profitability, like it's accumulation. So looking at it in a kind of systems theory or cybernetic, cybernetic sense, they're radically different systems in that they are different in which variables are being controlled, like which variables are being regulated. And they're also different in the structure of the regulators and the relation between the regulator and the variables. They're very, very different systems. And if, if you do Marxist communism as he describes it, a lot of this other shit just melts away because a lot of the problems you kind of face with like, I don't know, market socialism or state capitalism, or whatever, are, are this kind of inherent problem of trying to regulate the production of life by coordinating a bunch of isolated islands of activity and then trying to make them fit together after the fact by doing distribution or whatever. Whereas what I think what Marx is getting at is you sweep all that shit away by going down a level into just like, what if you figured it out ahead of time? Or what if the only thing you worked on was the stuff you needed to work on? Then all of this other stuff of like keeping firms calibrated with each other or like distributing this many shoes or whatever would kind of cease to be a problem. Like you would, you would kind of just imminently produce all the shoes you needed. And you, like, so, so, so many of these kind of problems melt away if you go down to that kind of level. And what's kind of telling is that like all these like, you know, actually existing socialist regimes simply don't do any of that. Like the, Marx's vision of communism, they, they don't even attempt to institute it. It's it's all it's all at that kind of level of like oh we're inheriting the bourgeois apparatus of like atomized individuals and atomized enterprises and then trying to stitch them back together again with a with a planning apparatus. Whereas I think what Marx is getting at is like don't even fucking bother just go down a level and have the autonomous human beings like emergently and like co- like intelligently produce their their own lives right like it's a very like when you read marx's kind of actual writing on this it's extremely berian it's that kind of like federation of federations of federations of co-ops that are kind of structured bottom up so that the the thrust for the economy comes from the bottom not from the top and yeah, the Soviets completely fucking screwed on that. Like, it's like, oh, what if we just centralized it all? And what if we had military fucking labor planning or whatever? No, guys, that is simply not what Marx is getting at at all. Like, it, it's not even, it doesn't even resemble it. It's crazy, you know? Getting to the socially necessary labor time idea too. And why that's, I think personally, a really bad idea. Because the weird thing is, is right, if you work in a big capitalist firm, they don't even do it there. Right. When you're internally in it, like say I was working at uh, AIB, the biggest bank in Ireland, Allied Irish Bank. Right. And they had this thing where, you know, you had like they had a certain pool of the wages for the department where you're going in that would be given out based on merit. And it'd be like five percent of your overall salary. Right. So like if you break your arse. Right. You might get like five percent more than the fella who's sitting beside you picking his nose. Right. Right. And like in reality, in most big corporate stuff when you're working in them, that's actually what happens. You get paid the same. If you're working in little stacking shelves, one guy's breaking his arse and you're doing fuck all, you generally will get paid the same amount. So even under capitalism, they don't have that socially necessary labour time in on the individual. Not so much. Yeah, uh, unless you're doing piecework, then uh, of course uh, you, you, you end up being your own boss in uh, disciplining yourself to produce uh, at the socially necessary level or higher. There's there's something that's kind of often missing from these kind of discussions, and I think is actually missing from this piece as well, but that the, the whole notion, I think in, it, it, even Marx says it out loud, that like the the wage or whatever, the, the, the value that's received is to keep the worker alive at a certain level of um, standard of, of living. So... A lot of these big capitalist firms, and especially like this, the sort of petty bourgeois, or the sort of middle class sort of layer, especially kind of in, in, in these times, right, or um, the kind of late century, 
they're they're kind of jobs programs basically to keep the the sort of pudgy fail sons of um of a you know industrialist kind of busy right like and sometimes that's kind of like pretty damn explicit because i used to work for a, a government agency over here that was like almost explicitly kind of structured along those lines of like we just need a cadre of folks who are loyal to the state and if that means paying a bunch of people you know 30 40 grand a year to do practically nothing of value at all and we'll we'll never actually grade them on their performance they can be as terrible at this as they want and we'll just keep paying them that's the that's the cost of having you know a, a slice of people who are loyal to the uh, to uh, to the state right the, the 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 way that the system tunes the the standard of living uh, and tunes the differentials of standards of living and kind of just pays into that more so than it pays value as such you know it i think is is undercounted yeah, you know, in that bank I worked in, Shane, get this. You talk. I worked in this in the head branch, the head office in in Donnybrook. In my our department, there was twenty five people. Do you know how many managers there were in it? Of those twenty five, fifteen, twenty, twenty one. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what what is that if not just a layer of fat that you keep around for the for the taste? You know, because like you, you you need this like you know reserve army of fucking loyalists or whatever you know people who will be kind of loyal to the setup and if i mean maybe, maybe the cost of just paying all these fuckers to sit around picking their nose is actually uh maybe it pays off if it prevents revolution you know <laughs> oh fuck okay so where do we want where do we want to go from here uh talk about lenin yeah sure let's have a chat about lenin so lenin doesn't come out of this paper all that well <laughs> no extremely not one thing we should note, like, I know we're going to go in here on um, this paper. It reads like a pure, He, I presume this guy is just a, Trots, a Trotsky guy because he seems to like, you know, has that standard Trotsky line of, oh, in 1928, there was a counter-revolution and all this kind of stuff. He's a little bit harder on Lenin, but like, I think he's, he's quite Trotsky. We're going to get onto some Trotsky scu- stuff. But like, you know, as good materialists, we got to, I think, somewhat couch the criticism of some of these Russian dudes in the kind of material situation that they were. Because, you know, like, they didn't have the revolution in Germany and all these to help them out. So they were screwed, you know. Their political decision to, oh, we'll go for it and it'll, the, our revolution will cause uh, cascading system revolutions was was a total disaster. And then they were left with the idea of, you know, what can we do? Are we going to go back to capitalism? Or are we going to try and just turn into, you know, some autocratic worker state? And, you know, that's where they went. So, like, so I, 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 well, I'm going to slag the hell out of them now, but I just kind of want to put it, like, in a materialist kind of surrounding before we just make out these are just simple bad dudes. Yeah, sure. Yep. But let's get to the bad dude stuff. Who wants to take take on Lennon first here? <laughs> uh, Kyle, you can have the you can have the first shot. Uh, sure. Back, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, so Lennon, uh, it says, uh, apart from his overemphasis on nationalization, accounting, and control in Soviet planning, Lenin did not contribute anything notable to the development of Marxian planning. So one thing that Lenin did is he distinguished the first phase of communism from the developed phase. So the first phase is socialism, and then you get to communism. Now, that is that is generally kind of like accepted parlance these days, but it's not a Marx thing. It's, it's actually something Lenin came up with. Now, Lenin did say that accounting and control is mainly what is needed for the smooth working for the proper functioning of the first phase of communism. Lenin didn't really know anything about planning going into the revolution. Which, that's kind of staggering, isn't it? Like, yeah, the only person who really knew anything about the subject was Bukharin because he had spent time in Austria with the whole debate going on there, uh, from what I remember. But Lenin himself knew just about nothing about it. He kind of assumed it would just sort of work out. So he says that he had no Marxist precedent for the construction of a socialist economy, neglecting Marx's model of uh, labor time calculation. We know about socialism, but knowledge of organization on a scale of millions, knowledge of the organization and distribution of goods, etc. This we do not have. It's kind of it's kind of crazy, isn't it? Like these guys were just like fucking winging it. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's very disconcerting the degree to which they like the the thing the thing that the Soviet Union ends up being kind of popularly known for, which is the planning, is basically a pratfall. Like it's a fucking Laurel and Hardy routine where they the, the bucket falls on their head and they they get stuck with it. And it's not something that's intended up front at all. Um, right. And is just very ad hoc uh, in the way it's pieced together. And does, I don't know. Like, were, was the critique of the Goethe program available in in this time? Like, no. I think it was. I, I yeah I think it was it was available only in German at this point I think interesting okay but you know this is where we need to get Vard on this on this podcast because he know everything about critique of the Gotha program and when it was available so yeah it clearly wasn't like the major influence for Lenin's conception <laughs> of planning no. Well, also, definitely not, because, like, I mean, Marx emphasizes, like, kind of unequivocally, like, bottom-up associative democratic planning. And then then Lenin's like, oh, no, accounting and control. That's that's clearly what the thing is. And I was like, oh, my, my guy, it just isn't, you know? <laughs> yeah. So in 1918, he says, our task is to study the state capitalism of the Germans, to spare no effort in copying it and not shrink from adopting dictatorial methods to hasten the copying of it. Our task is to hasten this copying even more than Peter hastened the copying of Western culture by barbarian Russia. And we must not hesitate to use barbarous methods in fighting barbarism. Uh. So we're going to impose state capitalism but through force uh, and we're going to copy the uh, wartime uh, military uh, planning of the economy f- that the Germans did in the, w- the First World War. That was Lenin's plan. Because he said, oh, well, the Germans have got it sorted out. They're, 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 they're like, they know way more than we do, so we might, we might as well copy them. Because this is pretty damning because we often get this kind of tailspun of like, oh, you know, they, they started out with really good intentions, but then circumstance intervened. And I think circumstance is a hell of a thing, right? But... This really doesn't read as if they started out with even the, the correct model at all, like, or even the correct intentions. Like, and this only gets fucking worse with Trotsky, right? So I don't know. This is kind of, Jesus, I don't know. Like, right, right at the root of this stuff, it seems to be just so far off the mark that I'm inclined to not even try to rehabilitate any of these fucking Russians, you know what I mean? <laughs> at all. Like, they're, they were so far off the mark in, in the beginning that, like, what, what could be salvaged realistically? That's May 1918. That's not, like... Yeah, it's not that far a jump from that quote in May 1918. This is before the German Revolution failed. It's not that uh-huh. far a, a jump from that to Stalin. I, I'm sorry, but it's not. It's right there. Yeah, yeah. It's right there in the fucking beginning. <laughs> yeah. I, I haven't read much Lenin now, but when I read that quote, I was like, you know, that's that's goddamn damning. That is a damning quote. And I will say that. The German wartime economy does kind of, it is like a really important background to every discussion of planning that followed it. But to say that the correct way to get to communism is to copy a state coordination of a capitalist economy is very odd. Especially to say, oh, we're going to use violence to force the workers to do this. Yeah, I don't know. It's fucking crazy. <laughs> like, I mean, how about copying Marx? How about that? You know what I mean? Like, fucking hell. I don't know. This this stuff's fucking insane. And like, and then it, it's, um, I mean, the, the, the sort of back part of this section then is like that um, the approach is, is very much, like it starts off on the footing of central control, like party state control, managerial elite, all this kind of stuff. And it's like... Have you have you read Marx, my guy? You know, come on. Like this, how how do you fucking end up thinking that this is the right way to do Marxian uh, economy? You know, it's crazy. On top of all this, let's just read the Trotsky quotes that I came across to actually today, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> let's throw right. Trotsky under the bus here as well at the same time. Okay, I'll read these. I'll read these bad boys here. On the question of direction of labour, Trotsky's views were heavily influenced by his experiences as commissar for war. Battalions awaiting demobilisation had been used on a wide scale for forestry and other work. According to Deutscher, it was only a step from the employment of armed forces as labour battalions to the organisation of civilian labour into military unions. Now, dr- quoting directly, 
Trotsky talking, uh, announced to the Congress, the working class cannot be left wandering all over Russia. They must be thrown here and there, appointed, commanded, just like soldiers. Compulsion of labour will reach the highest degree of intensity during the transition from capitalism to socialism. Deserters from labour ought to be formed into punitive battalions or put into concentration camps. Going on, Trotsky declared that the militarization of labour is the indispensable basic method for the organisation of our labour forces. Is it true that compulsory labour is always unproductive? This is the most wretched and miserable liberal prejudice. Chattel slavery too was productive. Compulsory slave labour was in its time a progressive phenomenon. Labour, obligatory for the whole country, compulsory for every worker is the basis of socialism. Like, th- that stuff is like, Ooh. I don't know where you can c- go with that, to be honest with you. Oh like, who knew that the, so- that the socialist revolution, the communist revolution was actually, we were in favour of actually Im- putting into power compulsory slave labour because it was, it was b- progressive. This shit is irredeemable. I mean, this is some fucking Borg or like Strog kind of fucking like machine subjugation of life kind of thing, right? That like the the the, the end result of this would just be a kind of machine civilization completely obliterated or all, all organic components just completely smashed beneath the fucking wheels. Like, and this is at the start. Like, that's why that's why Trotsky is still kind of close to the close to the the centers of power, right? I think that this shit is just fucking irredeemable from the beginning. Like, this isn't a this isn't a matter of like people with the right intentions. Like just going going off the rails. It's like they, they were not on the fucking rails from the start. And like just trying to rehabilitate this stuff just seems kind of insane. Like there's there's a reason why this like ends up. You know, normies have this kind of red swastika kind of reaction to to the, even the mention of the term communism, and it's it, there's a kind of a good reason. I mean, I am a, a self described communist, but god damn, like what 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 are you meant to fucking explain to people that like oh no, you know that guy that was at the heart of the whole fucking thing, he was just kind of I don't know nuts or something. Uh, oh, and that other guy that was close to the heart of the whole thing, he was just you know cuckoo as well. And it's like what what are you even trying to defend at that fucking point? Well, th- this is why you know Ernst Jünger supported <laughs> the Soviet Union over yeah. the Nazis because he believed that they're closer to that sort of machine annihilation of individuality and just this kind of like violent subsumption of everything into machine civilization. Now, uh, I think it's worth also reading that little quote at the end there, Tom, that, that Trotsky has on wages. If you can pull that up. It says... Wages must not be viewed from the angle of securing the personal existence of the individual worker, right? Which is basically what they do under capitalism is you get this package of money that just lets you survive. That's it. So no, that's, that's not how to think about wages, but should measure the conscientiousness and efficiency of the work of every laborer. Trotsky stressed that coercion, regimentation, and militarization of labor were no mere emergency measures. The worker state normally had the right to coerce any citizen to perform any work at any time of its choosing. It's like, oh, you don't, like, you don't have a right to exist. You don't have a right to live. Like, if you are not conscientious and efficient in your work, then you should die. That's what, that's what Trotsky's saying there. Like, what kind of, like, this idea that, like, you know, compulsion is going to be the most intense at the time to the transition to socialism is just bizarre. Like, how do you get from that to socialism? Like, is is that what's going to train the population to become, like, (laughs) effective governors of themselves that they're reduced to the state of slavery? I don't think that's even their objective, though. Like, I, I, I strongly do not even believe that Lenin or Trotsky gave a shit about human autonomy or like the the flourishing of human life or anything like that like I it is with the evidence presented it's kind of impossible to believe that they gave a fuck about any of that like like it what the fuck were they thinking like it's this bears no resemblance to the the the, the sort of um emancipation of uh, of human uh, life or whatever or the, the the sort of restoration of balance with nature or any of that kind of stuff like, this is just death drive like manifest in in just psychotic fucking weirdos uh crazy stuff you know 
I think they're politicians. Yeah. And I think they've seen that their plan for it was a disaster. And then they're left with a choice of, well, do we do we double down? <laughs> double down, yeah. Yeah. And accelerate. And they just yeah. go, okay, let's just double down and let's just wrap all this bullshit into our previous... They might have had good intentions at the start, but, you know, people are well able to just kind of go, all right, it's time to fucking double down, boys. Yeah. Let's just, like, change our opinions. Let's just fucking rubbish the guy that we actually like. You know, look at any kind of, um, what would you call it, sock them left people, right? They do exactly the same stuff all the time. The people that want to be on Novara Media or any of these things, you know, they never talk about Marx or, you know, or Jacobin. Some of the arguments they make in Jacobin magazine sometimes are fucking ropey as fuck, you know, where they where they actually literally write articles on how, oh, yeah, well, we should probably back a coup in fucking, you know, Nicaragua or something. It's the same kind of rubbish. Just this is a particularly rough fucking <laughs> episode in humanity. Where they're, yeah, they, where they're, they've been through the, the civil war. self servingness just went fucking grimly bad for millions of fucking people. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I'm simplifying it too much. I don't know. No, I, I think that's exactly what happened is that, you know, they went through the civil war, which is unbelievably brutal. You know, the first world war happened. They had this hope that uh, things were going to come through in Germany they went all in on that and then they doubled down because they were they were they were boxed into a situation where the only thing that could happen at this point if they just gave up the ghost was to be killed pretty much and so there's this kind of self-preservation at this point which is not a not a good motive no. to uh, enslave your entire country i mean I, I could imagine i mean yeah maybe that's a good corrective right that I, I could imagine that in the very beginning they were committed to some sort of decent ideal but like this this stuff is fucking crazy and like you know there is an alternative there of just let yourself get shot or whatever like because if yeah. if you're pitching like i don't know the the fucking machinic enslavement of of all of humanity versus like oh it would be a real fucking shame if i died you know i don't know maybe there's a fucking moral calculus there <laughs> to like not go ahead with doubling down on this stuff like it, it, like we, we mentioned Ernst Younger and it just reminded me of that stupid fucking book that we tried to read um malign velocities but it, this does give that kind of landian ammo of like Like, Land remarks that when the communists try to do any degree of calculation in productivity, they end up just replicating exactly the same logic as capitalism. And for Land, in his meth-fried brain, that just means that capitalism is an ontological feature of the universe, that if you ever do calculation, you're doing capitalism. But you know what? Like, with with the history of the Soviet Union, it's... I kind of don't blame him for coming to that conclusion because, like, it just replicated all of the same shit and and just as bad, you know, because it didn't actually change the logic of what was going on. Like, it 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 explicitly the fucking guy is like, oh, we should totally imitate like German like command capitalism. That's what we're going to imitate, and we're going to go to any lengths to imitate it. Like, fucking hell, <laughs> this is insanity, you know. Will we move on then to talk about what the actual planning in the Soviet Union during war communism was. Yeah, it, 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 uh, so uh, 1918 to 21, we have the period of war communism, a period of nationalizing industry and abolishing the market economy. So there was essentially no market operating in uh, the Soviet Union at this time. And this means that, like, for some people, it's seen as the, the prototype for Marxian communism because it's a non market economy. But the author here, Zhang here, says that uh, war communism was nothing else than a rationing economy imposed by the extreme shortage and besieged situation of wartime. Indeed, the industrial production of Russia in 1920 fell to less than 15% of that of 1913. So you think we got it bad now? Well, this, this, is, this is real rough. So on the other hand, the supply of money doubled. Uh, and quintupled by 1920. With galloping inflation, the distribution of the goods at the prices fixed by the Soviet government became virtually free. (laughs) The calculation of equivalents was frequently made on the basis of amounts of grain or other products. Indeed, as Carr noted, the financial characteristic of war communism was the virtual elimination of money from the economy. This was, however, in no sense the product either of doctrine or of deliberate design. The system was dictated not so much by theory as by urgent practical needs. And this is true, right? Like the the nationalization that happened was often driven by the workers, not by the Bolsheviks, 
right? Like they, the, the workers would just go ahead and nationalize a place. And then the Bolsheviks would kind of like, you know, show up <laughs> and put their stamp on it, even though they didn't think it was a good idea sometimes. So, however, the Bolsheviks made virtue of necessity and even tried to accelerate the process by identifying specifically how the market economy would cease to function with the coming of communism. Uh, so the second all rush Congress of, Congress of Councils of the National Economy in 1918 expressed the desire to see the final elimination of any influence of money upon the rela relations of economic units. So like that sounds pretty good, right? But <laughs> you the devil's in the details. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Um, in 1919, Lenin says uh, the Russian Communist Party will strive as speedily as possible to introduce the most radical measures to pave the way for the abolition of money, first and foremost to replace it by savings bank books, checks, short-term notes. So then in 1919, we have the ABC of Communism by uh, Bukharin and Preo Brzezinski. And this described communism as a system where workers collectively own the means of production and take the goods they need from public warehouses. According to them, the communist economy was a planned administrative one managed by newly trained specialists recruited from the working class. One of the fundamental tasks of the Soviet power was and is that of uniting all the economic activities of the country in accordance with a general plan of direction by the state. It's like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> is that so? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> way off base from the start here again, right? Fucking hell. Yeah, the foundation Incredible. of communist society is laid by the organization of industry and first of all by a purposive unification of industry under state control. Mm hmm. So that very much gets to the thing I was talking about earlier, where, like, for Marx, the, the whole point is the organization of life. Right, that like the, the the producers of life will organize their their own activities and collaborate uh, bottom up to to bring about the emergence of a communist society. But for these for these fuckos, um, the whole point is the unification of industry, which is presupposed to already exist. That like it is presupposed that you will preserve all of the relations and all of the structures of this of this bullshit, and then just bring it under state control, which is just emphatically not what Marx is talking about at all. Like. You couldn't be further from it. <laughs> right. That, it just, ah. So like when Marx talks about like the dictatorship of the proletariat or, you know, the fact that the economy that will come into being in communism will initially be entirely stamped by its capitalist providence. There is like a sort of theoretical basis for what is being said here. But th this idea that uniting all of ac economic activities under the direction of the state is what Marx was going for is totally off base because, you know, Marx hated the state just as much as anyone. So like, why would he say, like, why would you, why would you see this as a Marxist position? It's just bizarre. Like that is the goal of communism <laughs> is to have state power over everything. I don't fucking know. Yeah, I mean, how do you get there? I <laughs> just like, what kind of magical thinking brings you to this fucking point? I don't know, man. But like, what this other point here, he says, like, the, the Lenin says, we're going to get rid of money. We're going to all be in saving banks, checks and short term notes. Like, that's just like money in another form. That's like a totally... Just fuck all of that shit. Get rid of it. But like, that's just <laughs> like know? saying, we're going to get rid of the notes and the coins in your pocket and we're just going to have them in bank books. It's the same fundamental system. It's like a, what? what is the possible point of that? It's like saying get rid of like a cashless society now and we all just use our bank debit cards. We still have fucking money. It feels a lot like the kind of um, the drunkard searching for the keys under the light sort of problem where like, you know, it's like, oh, he's, he's searching under the lamppost because that's where the light is. That's not where he dropped his keys, but that's where the light is. And so that's where you should search. It's a very like, it's a weird switcheroo on like what's desirable versus what's possible that like you trick yourself into desiring what's possible. Or something, something fucking crazy like that. I don't know. And, and um, well, it's it's about the abolition of exchange, right? So this this uh, system it is distinguished from capitalism in the sense that all of economic coordination happens through basically the state bank, right? And so it, there is an elimination of exchange between individuals, but that that doesn't like. <laughs> 
<laughs> like who gives a shit? You know, it, it, it's <laughs> it's not the point. It, it, it's it's not like look. You can get into the technicalities, but the, I think the, the 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 sort of end of it is in no way does it improve the autonomy of human beings, uh, nor does it improve their freedom, right? Like yeah, there are technical differences you could get into, but like at the end of the day, that's what matters, and it it just does not actually improve that. You don't even have consumer sovereignty, quote unquote, in a system like this, right? Like where in capitalism, we experience a certain degree of freedom in being able to act as consumers and buy things, right? But like you don't even get that in <laughs> in, yeah. in this system. <laughs> it's like it's a oh kind of God. fraudulent freedom that we experience. But I don't know. I mean, it's better than just being like, here's your... Here's your ration that you bought from the state warehouse. You bought them at fucking gunpoint from the state warehouse, you know? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah, literally, right? Um, Holy shit, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is an important point here. This is where it starts to shift, right? Uh, so during this period, the Bolsheviks seriously considered money and replacing it with natural units, including a labor unit. Some party members imagined that they would come in the end to doing without any calculations in rubles, reckoning the energy used by numbers of days and hours. Uh, reflecting in the, the contemporary mood, in 1920, the third All-Russian Congress of Councils of National Economy decided to organize a seminar to study the problems of a moneyless economy. At the seminar, Crave suggested a labor unit, that is, socially necessary labor, as the unit of account for the moneyless economy. Crave's model seemed to apply to the Marxian one, for it assumed that the worker would receive units specifying the number of man-hours worked and would draw from the distributive organs various products up to this labor value. However, this construction did not progress beyond theory. In fact, the market economy was not abolished during war communism. Indeed, the Soviet government introduced a new ruble, the Chervonets, in 1919, replacing the old rule of the Tsar. The so-called abolition of money during this period was nothing else than a clearance transaction on the books similar to the practices of the banks of Western capitalism. Money functioned as accounting money during war communism. Goods were distributed not only through rationing at fixed prices by the state agencies, but also substantially through private commerce, including parcel businesses. I like this uh, the tangential sort of reference to basically like thermodynamic accounting. Like it's it's just the energy that, that's that's being tracked in the ideal ideal form. That's that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's been a kind of planning idea that's been floated since like the I guess the twenties uh, thereabouts. But there there are certain reasons why it's it's less preferable than accounting in labor units. But but yeah, it is a it is a. An interesting uh, uh, approach. It, it's also noticeable there that Creve he introduced a socially necessary labor time unit and not just yeah. like concrete hours. Because what did they wanted to do? They wanted to condition labor, and it's it's no surprise that that was chosen as the unit of account. Right, and that only becomes kind of more obvious in the next section then with like the the, the NEP and this kind of like the back and forth with the like food shortages and market bullshit and this sort of, sort of thing. But then it kind of le- really becomes more concrete of like the the plan to um what they need out of the labor force is um technical technical acceleration they need uh they just need to harvest bioenergy from the populace and then turn it into tanks basically um like that that becomes more like so so it, it boots it, it begins at a pretty bad place right of like this uh, command economy kind of shit and then only kind of gets worse as time wears on and especially as the nep kind of falls apart it's uh, it's not it's not good stuff we have this discussion of Trotsky, like, I guess this is still in the NEP period, but trying to figure out what to do. Trotsky essentially argued that planning needed to happen at the commanding heights of industry, and it should be transferred from the party to Goss plan. So essentially, Trotsky was making a technocratic argument against the argument of management by politicians. And... He says here, Trotsky's concept of planning was crucially different from a Stalinist command economy in that it emphasized control by market and Soviet democracy, as well as autonomy from the party. However, it is also true that Trotsky's concept of planning was substantially different from that of Marx. 
in that it prioritized the roles of leadership of the party and the state sector. Indeed, Trotsky tended to equate planning with the issue of leadership, reverting to his militaristic approach to planning during war communism. Uh, above all, the Marxian idea of the labor time calculation is totally missing from Trotsky's concept of planning. I think what's kind of interesting in this little section here is that the list of three things that Trotsky kind of wants as the, the regulators of the planned economy, right? He has the, the hierarchy of plan commissions, trade and for like market regulation of the system, and Soviet democracy for like regulation by the masses of the economy. But like, you know, turning on cybernetics brain, like what's the relation between these regulators? And what, what, what kind of variables are they actually optimizing for? Because if, you, if you've got three regulators that are all interacting in that kind of way, like they're a, they're a kind of meta homo, homeostat of, of some sort. And it's like, what's that machine actually optimizing for? It's, it really has to be a kind of question that's, uh, that's brought out there. And like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it seems to that they were really trying to optimize for um, just like churning out heavy industry stuff as fast as possible rather than optimizing for, you know, uh, human flourishing. You know, of the three... Number two, trade as a system of market regulation. They didn't really have much trade. Well, this is during the NEP. This is during the NEP period, right? So they did. They did have trade. This is 1932, I suppose. They had some trade, but not much, probably. I'd say the trade with outside of Russia was substantially down in that period. You know, it was yeah, a yeah. trickle. And then three, Soviet democracy as a system of living regulation by the masses. That didn't exist. So literally... The, it was literally all came down to one special state departments. So that was a regulator. That was their only homostat, really. Right. Yeah. It just becomes gas plan, right? Yeah. And that's the because the other two don't work out and uh, or just don't happen. And then once uh, once Stalin kind of muscles in, it's like, well, you know, it's it's gas plan all the way, right? Uh yeah. Fuck. I don't know. Even by thirty two, was there democracy? There wasn't anything left, was there? I don't think so. Not in terms of no. So when Trotsky's saying that in thirty two, he's full of shit. About the third part. Or he's pitching it, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's a pitch, yeah. There were many economists and uh, theorists at this time who actually wrote about the problems of planning. And this kind of, it, it kind of contributed to the original idea of the five-year plan. And we have the prototype of input-output tables coming up around this time. However, under the NEP, the, the labor time accounting tried in the preceding period of war communism was no longer considered as a feasible option, but as instead was postponed to the distant future of developed communism. For example, Preo Brzezinski, once a representative theoretician of war communism, argued in his book The New Economics that only after the transition to socialism would the economy be coordinated on the basis of direct calculation of labor time. Then the Stalinists come in. <laughs> Uh, most of these theorists are executed or purged, uh, branded <laughs> yeah. as Menshevik counter-revolutionaries. Let's list some of them. Let's list some of them for posterity. Kondratiev, Chayanoyev, Gromov, Ginsburg, Rubin, et al. He says et al. So I presume, like all these other ones he mentioned up above, Smith, Gromov, Popov, Strumilov, Varga, all of these major thinkers all got the chop under Stalin. Every single yeah. one well, of them. Have you ever heard of them? Have you ever heard about them from after that time? You know what I mean. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. I mean, obviously, Kondratiev survived this uh, period, but uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> a lot of them did. <sighs> so essentially, Stalin terminates the leadership by specialists. The sort of technocracy that's floated by Trotsky is uh, denied. Uh, so, ironically, the so-called Stalinist planned economy was born on the corpses of almost all the contemporary Marxist planners. Burn. And we, we transition to, from the sort of potential of a planned economy uh, towards essentially what was a command economy, right? We have various levels of bureaucrats who basically fight it out for resources, and the five-year plan is like considered to just be sort of like a suggestion. It's like, yeah, like we kind of think this might be a good idea to do it this way, but it's really just like a object of political contestation between all of these bosses who are actually running everything. 
Yeah, so I mean, it's it's really a kind of tributary kind of mode of, uh, of production where it's this um, this kind of quasi feudal kind of layer of, uh, of of boss planners who use the the draft plan or whatever as a kind of smokescreen of legitimation for their like extraction regime. And it's like I don't know, like you, you can either just you can either take the suggestion from the plan and modify it, or you can kind of like do whatever the fuck you want and kind of gesture back to the plan vaguely as like, well, you know, it's in the spirit of what was planned, whatever. Um, But ultimately, it's just like accumulation, right? The thing is, the plan was subject to constant adjustment. And the adjustment was determined through political struggle uh, is pretty much how it worked. And I think, uh, like, what was it, like, you know, Khrushchev's famous quote where he says, like, can't we get anything done in this country without yelling at someone? (laughs) <laughs> that's, the, that's the that's the form of quote-unquote planning that was existed in this period um oh, what do you call that english actor with the big barrel chest and the beard brian blessed you all just yep, want to be yeah. brian blessed <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> well that's that's it right it is this very charismatic tyranny right like of uh of these uh these bureaucrats just duking it out to be the most machismo sort of dudes or whatever and get their get their will that way like th- th- this isn't a fucking like social system at all like the, the society doesn't exist here it's just these dead-eyed psychopaths ro- roaring at each other um is how everything actually works it's crazy well and you know we saw in red plenty right like that the other side of this was like the constant fear of being executed or being demoted to like a laborer position right like a lot of these planners were absolutely terrified and were constantly like fudging the books, trying to make wheels of deals here and there to somehow keep their heads on their on their shoulders. And there was the whole gray economy, right, of like, um, yeah, just sort of borderline criminal sort of stuff, which had to like patch over the the cracks. Like, I mean, oh, we're, we're short two shipping pallets of bricks for this building or whatever. And I was like, ah, I can sort that out for you, you know? And so the, the actual, like, variety of the economy was absorbed by this kind of informal layer of, um, you know, people people who nobody would admit existed or that they were talking to, um, which we also saw in Red Plenty, I think. And, and Stalin, Stalin on this, he says in 1930, for us, the five-year plan, like every other is merely a plan adopted as a first approximation, which has to be made more precise, altered and perfected in conformity with the experience gained in the localities, with the experience gained in carrying out the plan. The drafting of a plan is only the beginning of planning. Real guidance in planning develops only after the plan has been drafted. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. See, the plan's only any good after it's been drafted. Then you can start to do the real planning, which is, you know, ad hoc, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> yeah. What's kind of ironic here is, right, that, like, I mean, with Trotsky's kind of suggestion, you get the um, the transfer of some power into Goss plan, right? But then you clear out the actual, like, talent and replace it with party party dipshits. Yeah. Um, so you've got the, the kind of spectral shell of a, a kind of semi-rational planned economy, but then it just kind of ends up with these, like, yeah, just like a, a charismatic tyranny of these, these weirdos just screeching at each other as uh, the way things actually work out. It's kind of this, like, zombie shuffle of, like, the worst of both worlds. Yeah. He finishes this, the last bit here, I'll, I'll quote a bit of the last bit of this section, which is, I think, wraps it up quite well. However, equating the developed phase of communism with outstripping the economic level of advanced capitalist countries or modernization is a cruel mockery of Marx's idea of communism. Stalinist Russia had nothing to do with Marx's idea of an emancipated society without exploitation and oppression. Just considering the facts, such as a rapid increase in the labour productivity, despite decreasing or stagnant real wages in Stalinist Russia, is enough to confirm that Stalinist Russia was no less an exploitative regime than a Western capitalist one. So, like, when they say real wages, what he means there is the actual basket of goods you're getting, like, yeah. You know, and in, in your capitalism, that tends to rise all the time. Your your money wage tends to stay pretty much similar. But your because things are cheapening in price, the commodities, your actual real wages, what you can afford goes up. But in Stalin's Russia, it was fucking going down. Right. So it shows that the rates of exploitation, because productivity was rising, your 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 wage should rise. So it's like 
it's like showing that the rate of exploitation must have been fucking insane. That it must have been yeah, much yeah. more exploitative than a Western one. And that makes sense. Like, how do you get fucking 15% growth a year or something in Russia? And like four or five in, in a capitalist one. You got to be doing yeah. something to get that extra 10%. It's what, it's what Preo Brzezinski uh, famously called uh, socialist primitive accumulation. Is you're just you're just basically forcing this stuff at gunpoint, right? Certainly not uh, f- an indicator of a liberated society. 